Welcome to the services of the Washington Avenue Church of Christ. Welcome to those that are worshiping through the live stream. Several are also attending today. After David's Rogers lesson today, I have a special announcement of an event we're going to be having right after services. So be sure and listen carefully to that announcement. We want to remember those who are in need of our prayers. And of course, we're all in need of prayers, but these folks have special needs. Justin Niederhaus had retina surgery on January 25th. It's good to say he's improving. Blossom Weddle's at home and is receiving outpatient treatments. Eric Gershenbacher recently had surgery and seems to be progressing pretty well. Cheryl Ferguson has recovered from COVID-19. And Corrine Hall desires our continued prayer. We have a long list of family and friends that request our prayers. Bob Hogue's sister, Nelda Johnson, was mauled by two dogs and is in Vanderbilt Hospital. and She's undergoing multiple uh, surgeries. Joyce Edwards, Andrea Wonderly, and Paul Edwards' aunt, had a series of strokes that's damaged her sight. Farrell Paul, three-year-old relative of Pearl Cummings and Marjorie Reisinger, is under chemo treatments for cancer. Lisa Marquette, Cheryl Holland's cousin, has an upcoming surgery. Lanny Hill, Joni Schulteiser's relative in Mississippi and a father of six, is improving in his fight against COVID-19 and diabetes. Arlene Willis, Wayne Trailer's sister, had surgery January 22nd. She'll be in rehab for two weeks in Petersburg. Jim Pringle, Trudy Harris' brother-in-law, is at home and struggling with COVID-19 complications. Sam Koblitz, Jim and Nancy Clem's grandson, has COVID-19. We want to also remember Joy Eldridge, Herbert and Mar Mary Lee Harper's daughter, She's in need of our prayers to handle multiple health issues. Gail Balta-Clary, Valerie Cox, Cox's sister-in-law, is seeking a new type of chemotherapy. Tiffany Galthorpe, Trudy Harris's sister, and four children need our prayers due to the recent passing of their husband and father, Justice. Mr. Ray, Jim Davis's English teacher, has cancer. James, of course, requests prayer for him. Brad Dalby, Randy King's brother-in-law, has been diagnosed with cancer and is under hospice care. Bert Kramer, Steve and Stephanie Miller's friend, requests our prayers for his health and upcoming surgery. And Carl Schmitz, Stephanie Miller's contact, is being diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing therapy. We want to express our sympathy and love to the family of Carol Bottler-Glary, Valley Cox's sister-in-law, who passed away on Sunday, January 24th, due to multiple health issues. Later on, we'll give details for the upcoming uh, shower and we look forward to that event. I want to also remind you of some upcoming events. On Friday, we'll have our senior Zoom. Teen devotionals will be in the evening from 7 to 8.30 on Tuesday. And uh, we'll have a few more announcements before the end of the services. Now it's our joy and privilege to worship together our God. morning. First song will be number 332, Lead Me to Calvary, and I'll ask that you all please stand for this first song. Number 332. King of my life, I crown thee now, and thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy Forget thine agony, lest I 
Song before the prayer will be number 662, All to Jesus I Surrender. Number 662. All to Jesus I surrender. Let us all go to our Father in prayer at this time. 
Blessed Lord, we come to your throne of glory, and Father, we praise you and we honor you. And Father, we pray at this time that you help us keep our minds focused upon you, your Son, the Spirit, and your Word. Father, truly, truly help us as we worship you to have the frame of mind, to have the concept in our minds, to truly honor you, to show our praise, our glory, Father, to show our worship to you. Help us, Father, to have that frame of mind this morning. Father, as we come to your throne of glory, it is our prayer that you be with the leadership here. Father, be with our elders and bless them, Father. Help them as they serve you. Help them, Father, as they lead this congregation. And Father, help us to be the people we need to be in honoring and serving you by serving them. Father, we pray for our deacons. We pray you be with each and every one of them. Bless them, Father, in their works and help them to fulfill those works to the best of their ability. And Father, again, bless them and help them. Father, we pray for all our teachers, those that are are in Bible studies with others, fathers, those that are teaching our young people right now, those that are teaching in classes. Father, it's our prayer you be with them and help them to stay within your word. And Father, to honor your word each and every day as they teach others. And Father, we're so thankful for our ministers, for David, for myself. Father, we're thankful for Josh and him coming to be with us. And Father, it's our prayer right now. You bless Josh, you bless uh, Megan as they're preparing to come and be with us and be a part of our team. Father, bless them and bless all of us as we minister for you. And Father, we pray for each and every member. Father, a lot of people that are struggling, a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people that have sickness. And we pray for them, Father. Help them to, to recuperate. Help them, Father, to get well and help them to be back in their rightful places of life. And Father, we pray for those families and individuals that have lost loved ones. Father, do be with those families. Help them in their time of, of sympathy and distress, and help them, Father, to get through this by focusing upon you and honoring you. Father, even in the, some of the dark times and the difficult times that we've been going through with sickness and other, other things, we're thankful for the blessings we receive. And Father, we pray that you help us to stay focused and count those many blessings that we have. Father, we're thankful for our young people and their enthusiasm, their desire to honor you. We pray, Father, for our senior citizens and all that they are doing still to honor you. We thank you, Father, for every individual that is living through your word and doing what you would have them to do. Father, we pray for our young adults and particularly, Father, for Robert and Mary Brooke today as, as we're, they're looking forward to their wedding and they're looking forward to, uh, to the shower today. Bless them, Father, in their new lives to, together. And Father, others that are also looking in the future and looking at getting married. Bless them all, Father, and watch over them and care for them. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for all that you do for us. Help us to stay focused. Help us to honor you each and every day. And we offer this prayer through your Son, Son's blessed name. Amen. Song before her, uh, Lord's Supper will be number 147, I Stand Amazed, 147. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Yes, 
As we prepared to take the Lord's Supper this morning, I would ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's a scripture that we read oftentimes as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. But as we prepare, I would like to, of course, consider why Jesus established the Lord's Supper for us to remember each and every first day of the week. And for those who are outside the church or don't anything, know anything about the Bible, they might say, well, who is this Jesus? And, and who is he? How is he so arrogant that he would ask people to remember him? Doesn't a person's feats uh, justify people remembering him? And certainly we know that Jesus did great many feats that certainly warranted us remembering him. But they might consider Christ arrogant to ask people to remember him here 2,000 years later. Well, we know that Christ wasn't arrogant, although justified be slow. He can, could ask us to do anything and, and, and be worthy of whatever he requests. But I think in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he, he provides some insight into why Jesus established the Lord's Supper. And we're going to begin reading at, at verse 23. But you recall a little bit, a few verses in front of this is Paul is condemning the church at Corinth for their uh, taking the Lord's Supper in, a, in, a, in an incorrect manner. There was division and they weren't using the Lord's Supper correctly. And he, he rebukes them for it. Let's begin at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed and took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup and saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Therefore, whoever eats this, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
but let the man examine himself so that he may eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is the verse I want us to pay attention to. For if we were, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. There was something going on in the church of Corinth. They weren't taking the Lord's Supper in a correct, correct manner, and that it appears to be there was consequences of that. Paul calls them a being weak, sick, and some of even asleep. And those certainly weren't physical attributes, yet they were suffering spiritually because they, they weren't taking the Lord's Supper in the correct manner. And I suggest to you that if we, the church, were to discontinue taking the Lord's Supper, the same fate would befall us. Jesus didn't establish this Lord's Supper out of a arrogance so that we might remember Him. He established it out of love so that we help us to be stronger in the faith, to help us live the life that He wants us to live so that we can have that hope of heaven with Him. Let's give thanks for the bread, please. Our God and Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this time of remembrance. Father, we are thankful in your wisdom. You recognize that we needed a time to ponder and reflect and, and think of Jesus and all that he did for us. Father, we, we're, we're mindful of the great lessons he taught, the examples he set, but at this time we're focused on the death that he died for us. Father, we recognize that the, he could have called 10,000 angels, but yet he chose to suffer for us. Father, as we partake of this bread, which represents Christ's broken body on the cross, Father, we pray that you would help us to be in a worthy manner. Help us to really think about and be thankful for Christ and his sacrifice. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup, please. Father, once again, we pause and we are all in awe of your love for us and the giving of your Son so that we might have that hope of heaven with you. Father, we recognize that without the blood of Christ, we could not have remission of our sins and we'd be unworthy to be in your presence in heaven. Father, we're once again so thankful for Jesus. And we're thankful for this institution that you established for us to help us along our way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
At this time, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, the elders of the congregation here have established this as a convenient time for us to get back to the Lord as we prosper. We have examples of this in the first century where Christians laid by in storage so that they could give to the works of the church. We live in an unprecedented time. So those who are present here, that uh, we have collection blocks at the, at the back of the auditorium you can give as you exit. For those of you who are with us online, you can use the electronic means available to you. But let's give thanks to God for all the blessings that we enjoy. Father, once again, we, we pause and as we reflect on the, the sacrifice that you and Jesus made for us, Father, we, we recognize that all that we have is pale in, in comparison to give back what you've given to us. But Father, you, we pray that you would help us to be of the right mind and have the right heart as we give back. We recognize that we are but stewards of the things that you bless us with. And Father, we pray that we, we would always be mindful of this. Father, we, we pray that we would never be stingy or grudging with our possessions, but all, always looking for ways to glorify thy name with the resources that we have. We pray that you be with those who are in charge of the distribution of these funds. Father, we pray that you grant them wisdom. We pray through these funds the, the, the borders of the kingdom might be spread. Souls could be saved. We can help those in need. And we can help those even of our congregation who are struggling. Father, we pray that you be with us as we give this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning, if you'd like to turn with me, will be from the book of Ephesians. We'll be in the second chapter, and we'll be reading verses 19 through 22. I'll be in the New King James Version. Again, that's Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And good morning, church. It's good to see so many of you. Uh, it's good to have you here together, and I hope you are thrilled to be here in order to worship God. Uh, enjoy the singing, uh, the prayers, the time of communion and giving together. And now let's open our Bibles up, and we are going to spend time in the Word, and that's always a blessing. Now, we've been spending several weeks throughout January going through uh, the series called The Presence of Jesus. And what I want us to think about as we do this is how much we need the presence of Jesus uh, in our lives. It doesn't matter if you are in times of turmoil and trouble, you need the presence of Jesus. If you are very, very blessed and life is going incredibly well with great gratitude, you need the presence of Jesus. If you are coasting along and you are aimless and can't figure out how your life should go or what direction you should be moving in, you need the presence of Jesus to give you direction. How blessed are we that we have access to the presence of Jesus in our lives through the Word, through His people, and knowing that every single day we can draw closer to Him. We began this series talking uh, about the challenging presence of Jesus. The presence uh, of, of Jesus brings certain challenges to us because it, it uh, challenges us to rise up beyond expectations and bars that we could never set for ourselves, it challenges us. We talked about pressure in the presence of Jesus. We talked about celebration 
uh, in the presence of Jesus, that because of Jesus, we have every reason to celebrate and be people of great joy in this world. We talked about conflict that comes in the presence of Jesus, and today we will talk about peace. In the presence of Jesus, peace. I think this is important, especially as we look at our near future, what we're going to be doing in 2021, but also in anticipation of the long future ahead of us. We have to anticipate peace, pursue peace, chase peace, be people of peace, because we look forward to that day when Jesus comes back again as a day of peace so that we can be with him in heaven for eternity, never being concerned if we're loved because we're in heaven with God. That's peace. Never being concerned with sin and the burden of it. We're in heaven. We're free from that. We have peace. No tears, no death, utterly eternal peace. Man, that's a beautiful thing to think about. So as we transition into the lesson, this is usually the place where I'll now go into a slide, a picture that would represent peace. And you may think, well, maybe he'll show a mountain. He does that a lot. Or a lake. Or maybe he would show some beautiful beach scene uh, that he doesn't even really like, but you do, so he'll show that. You may think that he'll switch it up and he'll go to some sort of escapism. For me, that's a movie theater. Man, it brings me such peace just to sit in a movie theater. For you, maybe it's a stadium. Maybe it's some other place for escapism. But no, when I think of peace, I'm going to go to family. I'm going to go to family, right? I'm not going to show a picture of my family up here. And at this point, you might be like, oh, well, he must be talking about my family. And you reach out and put your arms around your children, your beautiful angels, and you're like, yeah, this is it. We're up there. You're a liar. There are peace. Come on, man. And families is the ultimate challenge of peace, isn't there? We want it, we need it, we hold on to those moments of peace in family. You can't get away from each other. So when you got moments like this, it's, ah, look at that. Isn't that the dream? Those sweet, sweet children just snuggled up with each other, loving each other. The moment is worth it. How about, oh, they love each other so much. The moment is worth it. And it warms your heart and it gives you that thing. And this is the picture you take and you show your, look how great my family is. But everybody knows. Because there's a common thing that happens with siblings. I have an older sister and a younger brother. I know. I know that my parents cherish the idea of this moment. But there's even these moments. Just two brothers hitting each other with pillows. Man, how awesome. So much laughter going through the house. But those of you with siblings and those of you that are parents, you know where this is going. You got about 10 seconds of laughter, maybe 30. And then accidentally, someone got the memory foam pillow instead of the feather pillow. Accidentally, someone got knocked upside the head. And now instead of laughter, it's tears. It's screaming. You know, I see some of you siblings out there smiling and looking at each other. You know what I'm talking about. This is where we're going with peace. I love this moment here because this is a great picture. The little kid, you don't know why. Maybe he's just a crier. Maybe he's a whiner, right? And the older one's like, Mom, please shut him up. Please bring me peace. But even though he's wearing the Optimus Prime shirt, a great noble hero, man, he looks like he did something bad. What did you do, child? And there's no bruises. There's no cuts. So he's really good at whatever he did, covering it up. A prodigy of chaos. But the beautiful thing about peace and family is you do have these moments. But then you grow up, you're taught, you're instructed, you mature, you elevate. Let me be real honest. There's probably not a week went by that me and my brother did not fight. Epic fights in our minds. Probably really sad looking back in reality, but we might as well have been flipping off the top rope in WWE fighting each other is how we saw it. But now, man, don't you mess with my brother. That's family. And you stick together, there's a maturing and a growing of peace the way it should be. The way it should be. We're going to transition from that and talk about Jesus and his incarnation and the kind of peace that he intended to bring, the kind that he talked about. But in contrast with that, the temple and what it was in the first century and how, what it wasn't in the first century was what God intended it to be. 
Let's go back to that passage that in the first week, some of you might remember Luke chapter 19. There was a passage we read in the first lesson um, that when we started the series, and it was Jesus about to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And as he came, there were people that were cheering and they were exciting. At the same time, there were people who were so opposed to Jesus and the idea that he was the Christ, the Messiah. There was tension that was building up there. But Jesus, when he came out and he looked over In Luke chapter 19 and beginning in verse 41, he drew near. And when he saw Jerusalem, when he saw the temple, when he saw the people, this is Jesus. He was seeing for what it was in reality. And that was in contrast to what it should have been in God's will. And he says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known... If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You see, in Jerusalem, this was the center of the Jewish mindset. This isn't just some piece of land. This isn't just some tradition in history. In Jerusalem sat the temple. And the temple was more than just a building. It, it should symbolize the, the connection with God, the presence of God. This should be the point where heaven comes down a little bit, earth comes up a little bit, and there's this overlapping in space where their spiritual matters of incredible importance exist. This is a place where they connect with God. So it's not just some space, some bit of geography for them. This is life. It's what it should be. And if you have the presence of God, how can you not have peace, right? But it becomes something else. It wasn't the symbol of that relationship between God and man any longer. Think back to your biblical stories as Jesus moves into Jerusalem, right? What we see is the corruption that existed for those religious leaders at that time in that particular instance of the temple. As Jesus goes into town, you know he's going to flip the tables of the money changers because the religious leaders had allowed the worship of God to become commerce, the economy of charging people for sacrifices and and banking and making profit over the worship of God. That's a corruption, a den of thieves. And Jesus says, this is not acceptable. But they allowed that to happen. Go a little further in the story, and you know that when Jesus is brought to trial, These people who were the religious leaders, the the people that should have been establishing uh, what was right and what was wrong and showing the integrity of leadership with God's people, called in false witnesses to lie about Jesus. Corruption had infiltrated them deeply, partly because they had earthly ambitions directing them. They were very concerned about establishing a social class, an aristocracy of the priesthood, that they would be in favor with the Romans as well. And they would look for expansion of their wealth, their lot, their social influence throughout the kingdom to the point that they would compromise the integrity of truth and who God expected them to be. Earthly identity and not heavenly identity. And on top of that, violence. The temple in many ways had come to symbolize violence with God's people. If you go back just a few years before this time, less than 200, you would be reminded of a time, and we'll get to it in a little bit, of the Hellenistic uh, influence from the Greeks. And um, Aristarchus uh, Epiphanes had invaded, and he was so troubled by the worship of God in the temple, and he wanted to Hellenize them and cause them to worship the Greek gods, that he desecrated uh, the temple itself. And that led to a great revolt in which the people fought back with violence. And you may say, well, wait, isn't that a noble thing? It would be if your sinfulness had not led towards that. And most of the cases of the violence that occurred around the temple, it was because their sinfulness and tendency towards idolatry and the tendency to ignore God's prophets and messages had allowed uh, foreign nations to come in and influence. And the reclaiming of that led to incredible violence, to where there was now a nationalistic mindset that to lead in revolt and revolution would lead to violence. And not long after Luke chapter 19, there would be a great revolt in the later 60s of A.D. in a revolt against Rome that would be incredibly violent 
and see the death of thousands and thousands and where blood would fill the street and the Romans would utterly desecrate Jerusalem. These are not a symbol of the things that God would uphold. To contrast, we have Jesus. Holiness. True holiness we see in Jesus. Jesus who was God with us. Jesus who was guilty of no sin and neither was guile found in his mouth. First Peter 2 uh, verse 22. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says he was tempted in all ways as we were, but he never sinned. He was holy. He was set apart. And he had a holy purpose, didn't he? Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. He was called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. He had a heavenly purpose because he came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came in order to bring peace, peace, sweet rest and peace for your soul. You see the tension, what it should be brought in contrast with what it was failing to be. And that failure would escalate to the point that the corruption, the earthly ambitions and the violence would lead to the death of Jesus, the Messiah, on the cross and a cruel, violent, horrible death absent of justice. Pretty terrible. But it didn't have to be that way. You see, I don't want to paint a picture that all the time that the Jewish people throughout their history were this bad off because there were moments that were amazing, absolutely faithful and devoted and very gracious towards God and full of gratitude. Even in the early days when Moses was to speak to Aaron, Aaron who was the high priest who would oversee at that time the efforts that took place in the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the, the incense burning, the prayers, the showbread, all that stuff, Aaron would have been high responsible for that. He had this charge, this blessing to give the people in Numbers chapter 6. Look at this. Imagine this is being said to the people, and this is the mindset and worldview that you have. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the symbol. That's the idea. That's the worldview that should have been coming across from God to the high priest, to the people. Holiness, heavenly ambition, heavenly drive and purpose, peace. In fact, the idea of the temple was something that was totally created with the idea of peace. It should have been a symbol of that. You remember David could not build it because he was a man of war, but he wanted to. He wanted to make a house for God. But God said, nope, Solomon's going to make it. The name Solomon, it means man of peace. The idea of peace is there. The person who's going to construct it, peace. First Chronicles 22, verse 9, God says, For I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. During the time of the construction of the temple, there would be peace. And when he was about to build the temple, one of the things that Solomon points out in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 4, is that the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. There was peace. The temple would have been peace in every way in Jewish life. This is the way it should have been as it was being constructed with the idea of peace. It had the presence of God. It would have drawn back their memory to all the saving works that God had done and how he had been there for his people. Peace. The priestly life, that there was a group of people whose sole purpose was to uphold the integrity and the truth and the purity of the worship of God and the goings-on of the temple, and making sure that that kept the people connected to God, peace. Even in great festivals like the Passover, peace, as they would be driven towards the temple and the memory of that. Uh, the Day of Atonement, one of the most sacred days for them in which they would gather together. The high priest would offer the sacrifice. The atonement to cover the sins of the people, remove that burden for a year, peace even in the worship and the daily life of the Jewish people. As they would have uh, studied their Torah, they would have been driven back to the law and the expectations of God during the tabernacle times and eventually the temple times. Peace. It should have been the core of the way they viewed the world and their connection to God and their identity. Peace. But the temple was destroyed in 586. The Babylonians came in. Why? 
because the people had become less fascinated with the worldview of God and more fascinated with the worldview of those around them. And so instead of taking truth and holiness, integrity and the qualities of God and remembering who they were and that great covenant with God, they brought in idols. And God would warn them, but they brought them and they would not turn back to him. And so the Babylonians came in and invaded them. In 586, that glorious temple was destroyed. And you can read in the Psalms the laments as they were lost in exile. The desire of some to even sing a song in the temple. The desire of some to be able to sacrifice to God, to worship and lean into Him as they had before. They lamented. That's a heavy word, but that's exactly what was going on. They lamented the loss of that connection with God. Seventy years later, it was rebuilt, 516 B.C., Ezra, Nehemiah, others. It was modest. It wasn't quite the same, but they had a temple, and they put the efforts back into that. But of course, time changed again, and other influences came, and they never completely escaped that. And as I said before, the Greek influence, the Hellenized Greeks came in, and it was destroyed, desecrated, uh, brought to a great offensive level in 169 B.C., by Antiochus Epiphanes, and they fought and they had the, re the revolt that got that back for the Hasmonean kingdom, the Maccabees. And then later, Herod the Great and his ambition to build and be known as a great builder began uh, a rebuilding, but more an expansion of the temple in about 20 BC. And he was really going to make it something special from a worldly view. That was mostly his intent. And they say that sometimes the building itself, the actual temple, might have fit with inside the infield of a baseball field. But when you include the courtyards, the steps, the pillars, and all the surrounding area, maybe as much as 10 football fields. Enormous. A great structure. And it took him some 80 years to do that, beginning in 20 B.C. and ending in the early 60s. So a thousand years after the time of Solomon, a thousand years in which they would have had time to draw closer to God, emphasize peace, uphold the holiness, integrity of the temple. And yet after that thousand years, the Romans would come in and in 70 AD, utterly destroy it. Just as Jesus said would happen in Luke chapter 19. But that's not how it should have been. And Jesus comes to usher in peace in reality. Jesus, who is God with us, came to bring peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, there's this great prophecy that's given about Jesus, and it gives us this hint towards peace. It gives these names of Jesus. And as you go read this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You go to Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, and this is Zechariah prophesying about when Jesus will come in and make that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is what it's going to look like. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the message of hope and peace because your king is coming. You have peace because of his justice. You have peace because of his salvation. You have peace because his authority is all-encompassing throughout the world and throughout the universe. Look forward to this day. And many did. But yet the leaders at that time, far from it, they were corrupt, had that earthly ambition, and full of violence, and couldn't all grab a hold of the purity, holiness, heavenly purpose, and peace that Jesus offered. Now, it's not shocking to us then after thinking about that history and having that context, why Jesus would weep as he looked over Jerusalem. Why Jesus would weep where here he was, God himself amongst the people, to do the mightiest work of salvation the world has ever known, to go to that cross and to see 
the corruption that had existed in the temple. He was going to make it right and set it to peace. I think there's some beautiful things that we see in the midst of this. And one is the transformation that comes because of the presence of Jesus and the peace it brings. Think about the conversion of Paul in the midst of this. You can read about this in um, Acts chapter 9. You can read his account in Acts chapter 22. If you would, let's go over to the Acts chapter 22 one because I love how he starts off as he's given an account of his conversion because he's going to hit some things. He's going to talk about, at the beginning of this, of where he was, caught up in the, the temple idea of the corruption and the earthly ambition and the violence that came with that. And in Acts 22, he's not going to shy away from that and how it shouldn't have been. Read with me here. I'll be in verse 3. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. There's the violence. And as also the high priest bears me witness in all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren. And I went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. You can read in Philippians chapter 3 when he talks about his uh, notability in the flesh, that he wasn't just some guy who was coasting through his spiritual life, but he was noted for his religious devotion, his zealotry to that mindset of the temple and what it came to symbolize at the time. He says in Philippians chapter 3, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so circumcised in the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me in that flesh sense, in that world sense at that time, those things that were gained to me, these, I have counted loss for Christ. You see, he saw the difference. When Paul was caught on that road to Damascus and that blinding light came over him, and this is Jesus speaking to him, he had to confront the tension that existed. The tension of what he wanted to so sincerely pursue. But it was corrupt and it was earthly ambition and it was violence and it was in opposition to the holiness, the heavenly purpose, and the peace that comes from Jesus. That when he went in and he went into town and he fasted for three days and when he was baptized, he was cleansed. He became a Christian. A transformation from the corruption to the holiness, the purification, the peace that comes from obeying and following Jesus. And it was truly a deep transformation because immediately he went out to teach about Jesus. And immediately, those people that had not given up the world and what it had expected tried to kill him. But it didn't stop him. Because the only place you can have peace, even if people are coming to kill you, is in Jesus. And that's why in the next chapter, Philippians, it's amazing. He's in prison and he's got these people working against him. Sometimes some of the own brethren working against him. But at this point in Philippians chapter 4, he's so transformed by the peace in Jesus, so transformed by his dedication and zealotry now for Jesus that he can say, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. He has a deep joy, a contentment, a purpose, an integrity, a holiness, a peace. And he's going to talk about it. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Yeah, that was a transformation. He's speaking this through experience and knowledge and faith and reality. The reality that the presence of Jesus in his life had brought peace. Unimaginable peace. And he wanted everyone to know about it. 
He had to share it. He couldn't keep it in. In fact, if you look at his books, he wrote 13 books, epistles, letters in the New Testament. In all 13 of those, you will find very early on this greeting that he does, grace and peace to you. Sometimes he mixes it up just a little bit, grace, mercy, and peace to you. But he wants them to know that peace. And in nine of those 13 books, as he closes the book, in some capacity, he's going to talk about the God of peace or the need for peace or that he wishes peace on you. It is a critical element of his books, the peace that comes through Jesus. I've highlighted 12 verses from this in the book of Romans alone. I want us to look at a couple because I want you to see what he's doing is showing us not just that it's a thing that exists and a statement of a fact, but how to embrace it and how to live it and how to be transformed by it just as he was centered and focused on Jesus. Let's start in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Verse 1, these are pretty quick. If you don't have time to mark them down, you can pull the screen back up at another time uh, or email me and I'll be glad to send you the list. But he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only place we will have true peace. If you move over in chapter 8, verse 6, he gives this amazing thing, this worldview, this idea. He says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. He's telling you how to do it. Change your mind. A transformation needs to take place where your focus, your hopes, your dreams, your drive, your purpose, spiritually minded. Because in that, in Jesus, is life and peace. He even goes on a little further. Here's what we need to talk about. Here's what we need to focus on. In chapter 10, in verse 15, he says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Let this pepper our speech, he's saying. Chapter 12, verse 18, even in the way that we interact with each other, as much as it is in you, live peaceably with all men. Oh, we need that message today, don't we, in our world. Chapter 14, verse 17, he's talking about the idea of how our behaviors, though we may have the freedom to do them, could become a stumbling block to the people around us, our brothers and sisters. Don't let it be a stumbling block. It's not worth it. Pursue peace is what he's saying. He's talking about foods and how some foods would inhibit relationships or make some people think they would sin. But he says, I'll start in 16. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things which one may edify one another, a building up. There's peace found in building up. And he goes on in the, the next chapter, verse 13, he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 33 of chapter 15, he says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Do you see how the idea of peace that comes from the presence of Jesus has resonated so deeply in the life of Paul? And what he's communicating is that needs to resonate so deeply in our lives that it goes out into the world. We cannot restrain that in the way we live, and we cannot restrain it in the way that we share that, define that, reveal that to so many in the world. But we need peace ourselves first, don't we? We need peace ourselves. And that's what he's beginning at. I love this, this transition point we have here with Paul because he's pointing to that, that symbolic corruption that was in the temple time period, but the transformation into Jesus and all that he came to represent and the purpose he came for, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful and real and possible for each and every one of us listening today. So what does this mean for Christians today? What does this mean for us? Some of this is fact, but how do we make it reality? How do we grab a hold of it? Well, 
First of all, let's remember who we are. Let's go back to the scripture reading and remember who we are. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are members of the household of God. You are brothers and sisters. You are siblings. You're a place of peace. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom, in Jesus, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Do you get what he's saying here? Christians, you are the temple, the dwelling place of God, the temple. You should be the symbol and representation of the presence of Jesus in the world and the activities, the saving activities of Jesus. You need to represent that in the purest, heaven-purposed, uh, uh, peaceable way possible. You need to be that in truth. Do you see that, brothers and sisters? In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Paul really drives us home to the church in Corinth. And remember, this was a divided congregation that had a lot of corruption that they were dealing with, but he's pointing them to holiness, to uh, heavenly purposes, to peace, when he reminds them, the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You can't forget that in your identity, and you can't cheapen what it means to become a Christian, and you can't let that become a symbol of corrupt things. Appreciate and know your identity in the Lord. And on top of that, now let's talk about things let's grab a hold of. We've got to continually develop a God-centered worldview. A God-centered worldview. What does that mean? Do you remember in Romans chapter 8, verse 6, when he said to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's a God worldview. We get that by spending time in the Word. Can you spend too much time in the Word? No. That is a resounding no. Will you be blessed by spending time in the Word? Oh my Oh my, you will. You will see the truth of God. You will see the expectations of God. You will see a way to be the proper version of a brother and a sister. This won't just be a moment. The moment that the parents hold up and say, see, they're good. They're good. I promise. I have a moment. And that covers the 60 other uh, moments in which they're screaming and crying in the household. No, man, there's a, there's a reality that we get past the struggles and the fighting and we don't have that world tension of aggression and destruction and tearing down, eating at us. But we have that togetherness, that love, that care, that worldview. What does it mean to be spiritually minded? I would challenge you to think about the things that you talk about on a regular basis. As we moved into Romans chapter 10 and we remember what he said in verse 15 that he talks about speaking and preaching the gospel of peace. What do you spend the majority of your time talking about? Now, I'm not asking that in a, in a judgy way, but only in a way that you reflect on really where you spend your time, where your mind is. There's usually a connection between where your heart and your mind is and what comes out of your mouth. That's your inner person and what comes out. Maybe sometimes it's just frivolous things, and that's okay. But how much time do you give to the spiritual things in your conversation? How much time do you do that on whatever platform you have? Maybe that's your social media platform. Does 51% of it cover the spiritual things in a way that builds up? Or does 51% cover the anguish, the aggression, the corruption, the hurt, and the anger you're throwing out in the world? And if you do that, does that bring you peace? Or does it bring up more frustration and cycle around to more destruction and more tearing down? If we spend the majority of our time in whatever platform we have, maybe it's a social media platform, maybe it's a blog, maybe you write letters to people, maybe you talk to your neighbor across the fence in sort of an homage to Tim Allen. Whatever you do, where is your mind, where is your heart, and what comes out? Is it life? Is it peace? Do you generate that to the people around you? Because we are not to be people of corruption, earthly purposes, and violence. What do we bring to that? 
Second, I would challenge you to pray for biblical peace. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, yeah, I can pray for world peace and move on. I, that's a good place to start, but that's not where we're going to stop. Do you pray for peace in a way with Lord help me see the peace and appreciate it in the world? There's a lot of darkness, but that's not my focus. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to shine right through that. Lord, help me see the peace. And Lord, let me be a person of peace. And Lord, thank you for the peace. In fact, can you develop your prayers, not just the first one in the morning and the last one at the evening, but throughout the whole day? And maybe this is a challenge for you this week. Every single prayer that you give, can you focus on peace? Develop it at the very basic level of, Lord, I want to pray for peace for everyone. Lord, let me develop that a little bit more and pray for the peace in the church that, that our brothers and sisters have comfort. Let me develop that a little bit more. Lord, help me to be a person that's not restricting peace, but giving the peace. Lord, let me develop that a little bit more. Lord, where am I not being peaceful in my life? Let me reflect on that and meditate on that. And let me, Lord, please show me how as I spend time in your word and I pray your word and I, and I give in your word, and now I'm giving a whole lot of time in that prayer to peace. And I'm allowing that to become part of who I am. And I'm focusing on it in a real way that I can now take that out to our final thing and give peace. Godly peace, word defined peace, as Jesus would want me to out in the world. I know I usually start with something very positive uh, at the beginning of the sermons, but I wanted to save it for this moment because I think this is pretty amazing. Uh, it's a guy that was in South Carolina, North Charleston, South Carolina. And he works, he's a principal at a school, and you may have heard this story. Uh, I think it's amazing. He works as a school principal, but it's in a very impoverished place where 90% of his students are below the poverty line, 90%. Those people do not have peace. They're wondering, can I eat today? They're wondering, do, do, do people care about me? They're wondering, of, do people treat me as less than and that I'm not capable of? They need someone to love them. They need people who's going to go above and beyond. So this guy, he could have been so happy uh, and just saying, well, I'm a principal, I'm an educator, that's how I'm there for him. But at the end of the day, I'm out. Good luck, kids. He's not that kind of guy. I think this is amazing. This is giving peace in the world. His name is Henry Darby. And without telling them, he went to Walmart and took up a job to work at night as a stockist. He didn't even tell Walmart that he was a principal by day. So he's going, and all the money he earns from that He's given to the school. He's given to his students. He's given them love. He's given them peace. Man, that is above and beyond. He said, we can't look at the kids as less than. We have to believe that they can do and they are capable and they're smart and they're the best. And he believes that. But most importantly, he's putting and investing in that with his own time and his own self. This guy is a light. This guy is a light. And this is the kind of thing that I think is so important for us to remember because sometimes we read about Acts chapter 2 where people are selling things and giving. We're like, man, that's awesome. Wish that could happen today. Or Barnabas selling his property and doing this great thing for the church. We're like, I wish that could happen today. I love these stories where you say, it is happening today. It is happening today. People are bringing and giving peace. And I don't want you to think that it's just some guy in South Carolina and he's the only one in the world because I know for a fact, and I'm not going to name names, that there's people here today in this room and in this congregation who do the same thing because we get the calls at the building. How can I help? What can I do? Tell me how I can make a difference. Great. Let's talk about it. Let's make that happen. Thank you for being those people. Thank you for being that light and for shining. It matters. It matters so much. I won't name your name, but people need to know that it's taking place. There's so many of you right now that are watching, and I know you're thinking, yeah, I know someone that does that. And that's your focus right now? Grab a hold of that. Join that if you're not doing that now. Be a person who brings peace. There's too much aggression. There's too much tearing down. That's not who Christians are meant to be. We're siblings, we're brothers and sisters, really and truly in Christ. He's our God of peace, we'll be his people of peace. That's what the world needs to see, us to be that in truth. Can you be that this week? I think you can. Today, your heart may be really troubled. You may be really tore up about what you should be doing in your life. Maybe you've been more... Uh, 
less than a person of peace and more person of chaos. Maybe you've done that on social media. Maybe you've done it to your neighbor. Maybe you've done it in public. Maybe you just hold that in your heart and no one's seen it, but you need free. You need peace. Maybe you're struggling deeply with a temptation or a sin and you know you need peace. You need peace. I can point you to where you can find that peace in the Bible. The elders in this church can point you to Jesus because that's where you're going to find peace. If you need help in that, if you need love and you need us to walk through that together with you, we'll do it. We'll be more than happy to do it. Come forward. Come for peace as we stand and as we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus, Father, tenderly upon your ear, sweet Thank you, Brother David. Peace. I want to remind you of opportunities that we have to study the Bible. Remember tonight at 5 p.m., we have Zoom Bible classes for those from kindergarten to the 12th grade. And at 6 p.m., we're going to have our regular Sunday evening services by live stream. And the theme will be asking for a friend. And of course, our winter quarter adult Bible study, where you're invited to be present or watch on live stream, will be a study of Acts. And Doug Egerton will be bringing our lesson on Wednesday night. We have a very special couple in our presence. It's Robbie Shiftless and his bride-to-be, Mary Brooke Willis. And so I've been, there's ladies have been working pretty intensely in arranging an unusual bridal shower. And I'm going to read this exactly as Tina Van Britsen. So listen carefully. 
We are excited to be able to shower Robbie Shiflett and Mary Brooke Willis with love and gifts today. While this shower will look a little different than usual, we are so thankful that we are able to get together to celebrate their upcoming wedding. As you are dismissed, you will be forming a line to walk through to offer your congratulations to the happy couple. There will be people to guide you so you'll know where to go. Please honor the CDC guidelines and keep your mask on and try to stay six feet apart. We expect the line to move quickly. We are thankful for each one of you. Now let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. Father, we do pray for peace. We pray for the peace that only can come through you and through your son, Jesus. And Father, let us find peace by going to your word, that peace that passes all understanding. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that we have. Thank you, Father, that we can be together and that we can look forward to being with you eternally if we'll be faithful to you to death. Father, help us lean on you, trust in you, and you will guide us all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.